Join us on a captivating journey to Oak Island, where every twist uncovers a fresh chapter of historical treasure. From strange artifacts and cryptic symbols to hidden chambers and centuries-old manuscripts, each discovery is a thrilling step closer to unraveling the island's ancient mysteries. Are you ready to dive into the adventure and unlock the secrets hidden beneath Oak Island soil? Korjan Mol, one of the crew members, has arranged for the Lagina brothers to meet with Sergeants Ricardo Lopez and Carlos Magro, both of whom are experts in Portuguese military history. Rick and his team have found some artifacts on the island, and they were hoping that they can affirm that the stone shot, which they have in exact match to what they may have here in the museum. They also brought along replicas of the stone shot they found on Oak Island. Upon showing it to the sergeants, all were caliber centimeters and maybe were 3.9 centimeters. Over the past two years, the team has found two small cannonballs or stone shots, one of which was recovered deep in the money pit area. Even more compelling was the recent analysis conducted by geology professor Dr. Robert Rayside, who believed that the stone they were composed of may have originated from Portugal's Azores Islands. It was confirmed that the team could expect their stone shot to be made in the Azores or here in the mainland, as they could use very small calibers. For these types of cannons, those types of weapons were mainly used on ships. It was a general rule that small calibers were used on ships or fortresses, but modern as they were lighter to be used on ships and also they could be used on the deck, which they call it as a swivel gun as they showed interest to see it. They come across a 15th or 16th century gun with a four centimeter caliber and fires a half Portuguese pound iron ball, as they also have replicas. As fitting the ball into it, it was a match. They were acknowledged by a plot twist that there's a possibility that if they were doing something on the island, they needed to protect what they were doing to keep people away. If they were building some type of semi-permanent or permanent structure, they could take this gun out of the ship and place it on top of the palisade. The team could have just found an explanation for how one of the potentially Portuguese stone shots was found deep in the money pit area. If so, it could be related to the evidence of wooden tunnels discovered earlier this year, which could date back to as early as 1488, as well as the high concentrations of silver and gold. Later that afternoon, nearly 20 miles west of Lisbon, Rick Legina and his team arrive at an early 20th century palace known as Quinta da Regalera. Here, Corjan Mole and Templar historian Joao Fiandero have arranged to show them one final structure that they believe may be directly connected to the Oak Island mystery. Everything they see here was built in the last century to create this magical Masonic wonderland, but it's based on much older ideas. In 1147, during the Crusades following his conquest of Lisbon, the first king of Portugal, Afonso Henriquez, also captured the town of Sintra. In 1154, the town and its administrative duties were transferred to the Knights Templar, who utilized it as a stronghold for centuries to come. However, in 1904, a wealthy Freemason named Antonio Augusto de Carvalho Montero purchased this property and established it as Quinta de Regalera, a vast estate where he is believed to have hosted secret Masonic and Templar rituals. It had a diameter of 13 feet. The initiation well has nine levels, mirroring the nine levels in the original description of the money pit. They all knew the original money pit was 13 feet in diameter, as it seems like a coincidence. In 1963, while conducting a lateral drilling operation deep in the money pit, Oak Island treasure hunters Robert Rustle Sr. and Bobby Rustle Jr. reportedly drilled through a series of mysterious voids at oddly descending angles, beginning more than 100 feet underground. This discovery led them to the astonishing conclusion that a spiral tunnel encircled the money pit, potentially leading to the fabled treasure vault. It is possible that the initiation well, with its nine levels, 13-foot diameter, and which was constructed nearly six decades before the Rustle's discovery, is in fact a replica of the Oak Island money pit. The whole point of the initiation vault is to create a representation of the influence of the Templars, possibly reflecting the influence of Masonic beliefs and ideals. It shows the ideas have persisted throughout time even to today, and that they must have been worth preserving. They all take the information back and analyze what it tells them. Upon the invitation of researcher Korjan Mol, Rick and the team are here to investigate potential clues that Korjan believes could tie the 14th century sect of the Knights Templar, known as the Knights of Christ, 
to a number of discoveries made over the last two years on Oak Island, believed to be of Portuguese origin. These finds include the stone road or wharf uncovered in the triangle-shaped swamp, a fragment of a ship's cannon, and two stone cannonballs, one of which was found deep in the money pit area. To begin their investigation, they arrived at the historic church of Fontarcada. It was confirmed that it was the first land granted to the Knights Templar in Portugal. In 1126, during the Crusades, members of the military order of monks known as the Knights Templar arrived in Portugal at the invitation of King Alfonso I in exchange for their service in battle against Islamic wars across the Iberian Peninsula. The king granted the order both land and great wealth that would help expand their influence across Europe and the Holy Land, where they are believed to have later obtained priceless religious treasures, treasures that some researchers suggest are buried today on Oak Island. They will not find written things. They will find symbolism in some details of the church that was what they did at the time. Upon entering the church, they split away from each other to look for symbols, with finding mason's marks as their first priority. Abruptly, they found a symbol on the wall of a 12th century Templar church, matching one from the mysterious inscription reportedly carved on the legendary 90-foot stone. The 90-foot stone has a connection to the Knights Templar in Portugal, as they know that this type of symbology has the potential to reveal many things. So they plan to conduct a comprehensive study of the Mason's marks. They've always tried to evaluate if there is a clue to who wrote it in the symbols that were used to formulate the cipher. Now they have another option to consider the maker's marks, but what it means to the person who carved it. Seeing the O symbol on the HO stone represented on the wall of the church meant something significant as they think there is a direct connection to Oak Island. So there's some information there as they just don't know what it is at this point. They noted that the identical symbol was present over the original entrance to the castle of Tomar, where the Knights Templar and later the Order of Christ had their headquarters. Thus, any journey that would have led to Oak Island in the 16th century would likely have departed from Tomar. They also must take a voyage to go to Tomar and figure out how it might affect their search. Some 2,800 miles to the east in the town square of Tomar, Portugal, they were acknowledged of the Church of St. Baptist, who was the patron saint of the Knights Templar. In 1157, after a successful military campaign in the Holy Land, where the Templars were headquartered during the Crusades, Dean Pius returned to Tamar, Portugal, where he became the fourth Grand Master of the Order. There, he made Tamar the new Templar headquarters in Portugal, and according to some researchers, the temporary hiding place for their priceless religious treasures. It was 1307 when King Philip and the Pope actually brought them to their knees. That's the official abandonment of the Knights Templar organization was in 1317. However, it is believed that several hundred knights escaped with their sacred treasures. Some went to Scotland, while others fled back to Portugal and were renamed the Knights of Christ. But to this day, no one knows for sure what became of their priceless treasures. The team acknowledged the symbol representations and inquired about Nolan's cross. Rick Legina could be correct in suggesting that the megalithic formation of boulders, discovered in 1981 by Fred Nolan on Oak Island, is a representation of the symbol for the Portuguese Knights of Christ. The long-stemmed Templar cross and Nolan's cross are quite similar. The stem is much longer than the arms, suggesting a connection between Portugal and Oak Island. In addition to the money pit and the swamp lot, eight, has gathered newfound interest from the team due to recent discoveries and developments. Among these are a large anomaly detected by ground-penetrating radar some 20 feet deep, mysterious stone-paved features, evidence of previous human activity represented by a large boulder, and a semi-precious garnet gemstone. This gemstone, believed by 32nd degree Freemason Scott Clark, believes could be connected to the Knights Templar and one of the most sought after missing holy relics in human history, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, while Rick, Marty, and Craig await government permits to conduct a large-scale excavation to determine just what the mysterious buried anomaly could be, Gary and Michael aim to find clues that may validate Scott Clark's incredible theory. Gary Drayton discovers an old oval chain link in Lot 8 while metal detecting. The old chain links were always oval, the newer chain links around, and if they notice the irregularity of it, it's a very crude chain link, speculating that it may have once been used to transport a large chest. The question arises as to who left it on Lot 8, 
and could it be linked to the large metallic anomaly that the team hopes to excavate as soon as they can obtain a permit. Their search continues, and they are led to another identical site where they uncover a big old ox shoe, seemingly out of place. This ox shoe was discovered near the piece of chain, and the detected metal anomaly buried some 20 feet underground is in remarkably good condition. Over the past two years, the Oak Island team has unearthed numerous ancient stone pathways along with ox shoes and other evidence suggesting large operations to haul cargo onto and across the island. Previously, the most compelling of these was discovered between the triangle-shaped swamp and the money pit. Have Gary and Michael now found more evidence of a similar operation on Lot 8, and if so, could it possibly support Scott Clark's theory that the Knights Templar hit priceless religious artifacts on Oak Island centuries ago, as they found these mysterious objects which reassures them that they are onto something here, as all sounds lead to activity and something happened in this area. This might be the missing link, telling them that they're on a treasure in this area. At the War Room, joining them are Tony Sampson, a seasoned diver, and Dr. Lee Spence, a renowned underwater archaeologist with over 50 years of experience in treasure hunting and underwater explorer. Dr. Spence has located more than 100 shipwrecks and discovered more than $50 million in artifacts and treasure dating back to as early as the 15th century. Their mission was to explore anomalies detected in the waters surrounding Oak Island. A week prior, Rick Marty and Craig commissioned CSR Geo Surveys Limited to conduct a magnetometer survey, which revealed compelling anomalies near Lot 5 and Frog Island. These anomalies, including a potentially massive object resembling a shipwreck, intrigued the team. Although Nova Scotia law restricts open water treasure hunting, they hope to secure a special permit if evidence of a wreck is found. Accompanied by Alex and David Fernetti, Tony Sampson and Dr. Spence embark on a dive between Oak Island and Frog Island. Armed with cameras and handheld scanning devices, they aim to gather more data on the metallic anomalies detected. Despite environmental restrictions limiting their investigation to non-invasive methods, the team remains hopeful. Using an Aquascan DX200 handheld magnetometer, Tony detects a large metallic object buried beneath the ocean floor's thick vegetation. However, silt and vegetation obstruct their view, prompting them to expand their search area. Another magnetometer hit suggests further evidence of human activity or a shipwreck, potentially linked to recent discoveries in the money pit. Despite Dr. Spence's confidence in a shipwreck's presence, obtaining an excavation permit remains elusive. The team's only recourse is to return and hope natural forces reveal more evidence, enabling them to apply for a permit. Rick Legina remains steadfast in his belief in the shipwreck's existence. At Lot 8, a land-based magnetometry survey identified a large metallic anomaly earlier this year. To conduct a more thorough search for clues, the team recently cleared the area of large trees and foliage. Gary Drayton was excited to discover that the only thing that they found on this lot was the magnificent garnet brooch. In addition to the large metallic anomaly detected on Lot 8 earlier this year, it was in this very same area four years ago. Gary and Rick unearthed a semi-precious garnet brooch a garnet brooch that gemologist Charles Luton Brain believed could be more than four centuries old. This prompted Marty to return to search Lot 8, as there could be more to discover. While investigating a thick layer at Lot 8 on the western side of Oak Island, Marty Legina and Gary Drayton have just made a potentially significant discovery, which was a large iron piece that appears to be an old chain. This piece has two brackets indicating its uniqueness. It might be a possible piece of a horse's bridle found on Lot 8, because the documented history of Oak Island, dating back to the mid-18th century, only indicates that farmers utilized beasts of burden, such as oxen, to plow fields, mostly on the eastern end of the island. If this object is indeed a horse's bridle, then who would have brought it here, and could it possibly be connected to the garnet brooch that the team found in this area four years ago? Or perhaps the large metallic anomaly that they plan to excavate as soon as they are granted a permit. It was massive indicating it might be one of those great big horses that were used for big reasons, either war horses or horses that pull big things well. The very fact that it's rare as they haven't found something like this on the island makes there something special about this island. Upon further searching on the indicated flag area, they found a big chunk of iron which was beveled on the end, 
Another possible adds found on Lot 8 and in the same area where the team's recent magnetometry survey identified a large, metallic anomaly. Sensors adds is a kind of ancient cutting tool that was specifically designed for shaping wooden parts of ships or structures. It could potentially be connected to the object or structure that appears to be buried here. It could be a tool or adds, as it speaks of activity in an area that was not habited, as there was no house ever built that they know of. Nobody ever lived on Lot 8. The next step in this area will be to obtain a permit and start moving soil that will be investigated. They will be meeting with rare documents and artifacts expert Joe Landry to get his analysis on the piece of leather discovered just one day ago in the spoils that were excavated from the money pit by Robert Dunfield back in 1965. Leather is always important for many of these holes because it can be dated. It was used for a couple of years maybe, so it's something they have to get an expert to look at. They all meet Joe Landry. Upon acknowledging the plot and examining it, he informs them about the process of oak tanning where they take bark from an oak tree and take an emulsion that they can soak the leather in. And the leather absorbs the tanning from this emulsion and preserves the leather, and the leather appears to be a shoe sole. Oak tanning was started in the medieval period around 1235. It could easily relate to different date ranges, and one in particular is 1488 to 1650, as it could possibly relate to that. It was confirmed that it was a potential fragment from a military officer's boot discovered in Dunfield spoils. One year ago, the team recovered the sole of a fine leather boot in spoils they excavated in the money pit area that was carbon dated to as early as 1492. If Joe Landry is correct in his assessment, it could mean that the two artifacts are related, and it could also offer hope that the team is digging in a location where something of even greater value lies buried. They need to press the envelope every time they make a find, as this applies science, technology, and expertise to try to understand and not just what it is and when it was made, as there are many questions, there are a lot of things to do, and that is what they are in the process of doing. In it, spoils which have never been thoroughly searched for clues or potential valuables. These spoils were moved around originally as they didn't have a magic wand. Going through the Dunfield spoils up by the money pit, it's been a hard job as there's a lot of things going on here. The good news is they could find anything in the spoil as it could have come from the deep in the money pit. Upon searching in the spoils, they come across a woman bracelet or a piece of cut cast iron pipe as they continue digging. Rick was keen to search any types of clay. They only find clay like this in a backfill of a shaft. Abruptly, Rick found a potentially ancient leather strap in the Dunfield spoils. Over the past five years, the Oak Island team has recovered several leather artifacts in the money pit area, including bits of book binding and the heel of a boot that was dated to as early as 1492. This leather strap could be also predating the discovery of the money pit in 1795. If so, what else could be still hidden within the money in so-called Dunfield spoils? It could be a harness, perhaps off an ox, or it could be the bottom of a leather shoe as it is thick. Usually they find little scraps of leather, but this is a quite large piece, but it could be anything. It's a heavy piece of leather, and Rick thinks this piece of leather is substantial enough that it should be tested. John Ginky and David Sampson might have the possible parchment just found in the TF1 spoils analyzed in the Skyscan 1273 device. Upon scanning by the device, it indicated the presence of iron, where they can see very bright spots in the center line which could be writing. Iron gall ink, also known as oak gall ink, is composed of iron salts and tannic acids from vegetable sources and was developed in Europe during the 5th century AD. Ever since the discovery of parchment deep in the money pit back in 1897, many researchers have speculated that the treasure lying deep in the booby-trapped money pit is composed of not just gold, silver, and jewels, but also priceless documents. It is possible that the team has found more evidence that this theory could be true. If so, what sort of documents would someone want to hide by such ingenious means? What they can say at this point is that they tend to see some lines, which would be indicative of a type of parchment. They all wait for the higher quality scans and plan to meet again in the war room. The following morning, brothers Rick and Marty Legina and members of their team are meeting in the war room with imaging experts David Sampson and John Ginky regarding the possible parchment discovered one day ago in the spoils from the TF1 shaft. As they examine the piece of parchment, they notice some striations in it. When looking at the cross-section, some little streaks are coming off which tend to come from materials like iron, 
They also notice another different color by which they can see relative densities, and as they look at that inner part, it tends to indicate they're looking more at a paper. Blue were the chunks of iron, whereas green could be a coated paper product. In the fall of 1909, upon reaching a depth of nearly 100 feet in the money pit, workers of Franklin Roosevelt's old gold salvage company exploded dynamite in the shaft, hoping to not only clear the debris from the 1861 collapse, but also to seal off the flow of seawater from the flood tunnel. The effort failed on both counts, and the company would close down operations at the end of the year. The team could have now determined why they discovered only small fragments of gold earlier this year during their core drilling program. And if so, since they have also detected high concentrations of both silver and gold where they are currently digging EC1, it could mean they're on course to locate the vast cache of treasure that people have been trying to find since 1795. The TF1 shaft in the Money Pit area has now reached a depth of 107 feet, which could yield a major discovery at any moment. While searching the dump of the shaft, Gary Drayton found a wooden peg or dowel. It could be related to the fragments of a wooden structure found in this location earlier this year that may date back to 1488. If so, could that mean the team is also close to finding the source of the silver and gold detected in the area as well? The older constructs that they've encountered have been put together with dowels, and that was certainly a dowel, so it implies possible or original depositional work, because in the modern era, dowels were not used as fasteners. Later, while searching, Gary Drayton found some big old fastener. Laird Niven confirms it's hand-formed, an iron fastener that was hand-forged because that could mean it might predate the discovery of the money pit in 1795. This artifact could be related to a structure that was built during an operation to deposit valuables deep underground. They do know that from the records, the FDR expedition only got to 107 feet. They know the money pit collapsed deeper than that. So, anywhere between 107 feet and 150 feet, where they might encounter the vault, is also perspective. On lot 15, where the team believes a buried stone path is running between the swamp and the mysterious pine tar kiln. Now that the team has obtained GPR evidence of the pathway, it is Marty Legina's hope that if Gary and Peter can recover artifacts predating the discovery of the money pit in 1795, a special permit can be obtained to excavate the feature and determine just where it leads. They both found a big rosehead spike upon metal detecting. They both go on to the next one, where they find another big old chunky piece of iron that could be a claw hammer, and if it is, it's very small. Dating back to the early 16th century, claw hammers were designed for building wooden structures and were originally made of hand-forged iron, as opposed to modern versions which are typically composed of steel. Since this iron claw hammer was found near the believed 16th century pine tar kiln, which Laird Niven suspects may have been connected to the construction of the original money pit, Gary could be correct that it was possibly used during an effort to deposit something of value on Oak Island. Gary thinks they're on the trail, and it's something good as well. These finds may indicate a path. Later, they get more definite signals, where they find another square-shaped piece, which would have been used for a wide variety of purposes on Oak Island. In the Money Pit area, a mysterious obstruction is preventing the massive hammer grab tool from removing spoils from the 10-foot-wide TF1 shaft. As the hammer grab tool drops a big dump of clay, it has a strange rock with a drill hole in it. It was probably the D2 borehole, don't you think? The mystery of the obstruction in the TF1 shaft has been solved. The team has unearthed a large boulder, which they apparently drilled through earlier this year, in the 6-inch borehole known as D2, a borehole where they discovered evidence of gold at a depth of some 90 feet. On the other dump, they got a great quantity of wood from it. Some of it looks ancient, whereas some looks modern. They were looking for stuff that substantially predates the search. They also found a boot at a depth of more than 80 feet deep in the TF1 shaft. How did it end up that far below ground? Could it have been left by a previous treasure hunter on Oak Island? Or did it belong to someone who came here much earlier? Vanessa states that they're about 90 feet in depth and have to dig one half more. Laird found that the rubber board says Kaufman, which was a Canadian rubber company, making these types of boots in 1908 or 1909. This might be the pit that FDR was digging in. In 1909, a 27-year-old lawyer and 32nd-degree Freemason named Franklin Delano Roosevelt helped finance the Old Gold Salvage and Wrecking Company, which conducted a large-scale excavation of what they believed to be the original money pit. 
Although the future U.S. president was unsuccessful in reaching the fabled treasure before his company's efforts were drowned by flooding from the legendary booby trap, some reports suggest they did recover evidence of gold shavings while drilling at the bottom of their shaft. If this boot did in fact belong to one of Franklin Roosevelt's team members, could that mean that Rick, Marty, Craig and their team are on course to make a breakthrough discovery in the original money pit? There is a connection between the boot and Franklin Roosevelt's work. Unfortunately, as the sun is beginning to set, the team from Irving Equipment Limited and ROC Equipment must now wait until morning before they can continue unearthing spoils and hopefully something of incredible value. As they finished for the night, the can was at 101 feet and the excavation was at 92 and a half feet. When Doug and Laird date the boot to 1908 or 1909, it sort of changes in importance to Marty because it ties with Doug's awakening to the possibility that they're digging in the shaft that Roosevelt dug in and that shaft near the original money pit. They might find some things deeper. Rick was ready to give up on that hole, which can impress him in any ways possible. Lot 32 turned into an odd little area with all the artifacts. Over the past two years, Lot 32 has produced some of the most promising discoveries for Rick, Marty, and the team. In addition to the evidence of a ship's wharf on the beach, they've also found ox shoes, suggesting an operation to move cargo onto the island, British coins and military buttons, and even a lead bag seal that archaeologist Laird Niven believes could date back 300 years or more. Upon starting the metal detecting at the suggested first place, they both come across a square ox shoe nail. The interesting thing was this wasn't farmland, so more likely something to do with hauling, especially connected to that wharf. At the second location, the metal detector sounded very well with a two-way repeatable signal as they found a fired musket ball. It was found near the site where the team had previously discovered evidence of a ship's wharf and a possible operation to unload cargo. Is it possible that this musket ball is somehow related to those discoveries? And if so, could it have been fired in an effort to protect what the team will soon begin digging for in the money pit? Gary claims it might be from anywhere from the late 1500s to the mid-1800s. They both look forward to finding more treasure. It was their last day because they needed water in the swamp to use on the wash table up at the money pit. This year, the team has made a number of compelling discoveries in the swamp, including more evidence of a stone wharf and numerous pieces of massive sailing vessels. However, because they will need a fresh water source to wash the tons of spoils that will soon be excavated from the money pit, they have stopped running the pumps that have kept the swamp drained for the last three months. It's time to start the massive excavation up at the money pit. Abruptly, Gary found a wooden handle potentially related to a ship. Rick believes that there is some information in the body of the swamp that will help them further the search agenda. Upon excavating further, they found a big wooden stake which had been axe cut. They found more small planks. Could all of the mounting evidence that the team has unearthed suggest, as the late landowner and treasure hunter Fred Nolan believed, that an ancient sailing vessel really does lie buried in the swamp? And if so, could it explain the 200-foot-long object that was detected by seismic scanning back in 2018? Marty Legina comes up and is informed about the latest findings. The wood that comes out of the swamp is pretty interesting because it seems to be out of place. They're getting pieces of wood that just don't seem like they should be in a swamp. Rick Legina and Gary Drayton were hopeful as they arrived at the last flag, and they got another two-way repeatable signal. Upon examining further, they both come across a big top pocket find of a coin with English language written on it. The size of this, the thickness, indicates something in it. It was in good shape. In 2017, while searching just east of the swamp on Lot 13, Rick, Marty, Gary, and Dave Blankenship discovered two late 17th century British coins. The coins were impressive as they predated the discovery of the money pit by nearly a century. However, with the addition of this British coin just recovered on Lot 32, might they support a new theory recently presented to the Oak Island team? One week ago, Freemason Scott Clark met with the members of the team in the war room and shared his research suggesting that the 17th century English nobleman Sir William Phipps conspired with Freemason Alan Belcher to hide a vast cache of silver on Oak Island sometime after 1687. Could Rick and Gary have found more evidence that Scott Clark's theory could be true? And if so, could it also be connected to the high levels of silver that the team has detected and will soon attempt to recover in the money pit? Rick states that the coin was a spectacular find just considering its condition. 
Every time they come back here at Lot 32, they find some coins and artifacts. Over the past two years, the Laginas and their team have made a number of incredible discoveries in the area, including a lead cargo bag seal that the team believes could be connected to the Knights Templar, Ox Shoes, and potential evidence of an ancient ship's wharf. They both walk up to the first flagged indicated area, which was a little bit rocky. They were getting mixed signals, but enough signals to dig. Abruptly, they both found a broken ox shoe in this area, which indicates some unloading happened in that area. It was thicker and heavier in size. They both walk up to the other flagged area, where upon digging, they come across a little copper piece which has a design on it and looks scripted. Could it be a fragment of a container or perhaps an adornment to an article of clothing? And if so, might it help identify its original owner? Gary Drayton was hopeful of getting some valuable information from this artifact as they move to the next. As we wrap up our adventure on Oak Island, reflect on the excitement of discovering artifacts like the Knights Templar Cross and the mysterious Lead Cross. Did these ancient manuscripts and intriguing structures pique your interest? Let us know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe for more thrilling expeditions.